for me, that's the greatest worry of the business. Why do we have people leaving the business in a relatively thoughtful period of time? Since 1987, 300,000 producers have actually been out of business. Our inventory is the lowest since World War II, and relatively high level of profitability in the past decade. We've not reversed the essence. Why? Not to be cute, but the best analogy I can come up with is what we refer to as the burden of accumulated aggravation. It's too hard to do business if you're not at a sufficient scale in light of drought, which had a significant impact on our uh, production system coast to coast. This is not a region of the United States in the last decade who has not suffered under some period of drought. The southeast has been particularly hard hit, as, as has the southwest. Land values. Um, land values have doubled in the last decade, farmland values. Why? Two reasons. Ethanol, and secondly, the recession. Smart money is afraid of all the markets looks for a stable base. And land's a great purchase when you're cash. When you've got cash, and you're afraid of markets. So a lot of investment was made in the land. Part of it speculated, uh, chasing ethanol-induced uh, prices. Uh, but part of it trying to find a safe home for money. That's had a huge impact. And it's important from our perspective, I guess, you know, we, uh, we're at some level concerned about resetting the, the table for a 1980s type uh, situation in the rural economy. Uh, and I think that's something that we've got to monitor like crazy uh, because we have these rising input costs, rising land values, and we're setting the stage for some potential challenges if we're not careful how we move out there. Regulatory issues for our producers are uh, increasingly problematic. Uh, it's not uh, a day goes by when our folks aren't being given another opportunity to come under the microscope uh, of the federal authority in some form or fashion. Uh, at some point in time, small business simply can't survive the weight of that, in, of that uh, burden. Challenged by our media occasionally, uh, the, the general state of the economy is not you know, left rural economies unaffected. Um, in terms of input prices, it's not only the issue of high prices; it's the extreme volatility of input prices today, and in the age of our producers, uh, is another concern for us. Following the cow-calf sector, um, the, the next big sector. The soccer enterprise is really has a lot of, of commonalities with the cow-calf business. The feed yard sector is, is, a, is designed where there's about 142 feeding companies with greater than 1,000 head one-time capacity. Um, there's lots and lots of cattle feeders who have less than 1,000 head. Um, but the 142 feeding companies who own multiple yards, again, high percentage of these family owned, um, control about 75% of the fed cattle inventory in the country. Our total fed industry has a 14 million head bunk capacity. The way our feeding system works, we ought to be able to turn that capacity at least twice. In a perfect situation, we can turn it about 2.2 or 2.3 times, and yet, we only marketed 22 and a half million head of fed cattle last year. So a capacity that we should have been able to market 28 million head is six and a half million head underutilized. Now that's vacant capacity. It's, it's, it's willful decision to leave capacity vacant because the price of calves coming in was too high, the price of feed grains was too high, um, and there was too much uncertainty about the marketplace in light of our domestic economy and the fact that we didn't have access to a lot of international markets that historically have driven a growth in our business. So that's a little bit of a quick look at the feed yard sector. Where does most of the cattle feeding occur in this country? In this little triangle in the heartland of the country. Why? Perfect environment from a climate standpoint to grow cattle. Feed production's there. Packing capacities in this region and from a distribution channel perspective, the interstate system running north and south and east and west, which is a very efficient way to 
create retail ready product and move it nationwide uh, from that sort of environment. At the end of the day, there are about five states that dominate the cattle feed business Texas, Nebraska, Kansas, Colorado, and then Oklahoma and Iowa sort of competing for that fifth spot. We also have a big cattle feeding sector in California and another cattle feeding sector up in the Pacific Northwest, sort of in this corner of Idaho, Washington, and Oregon. Remember I told you to remember all these cattle down here from uh, the southeast? Well, notice cattle feeding doesn't, is, is so small we don't even, we can't even get a number on that. Why? This is a terrible environment in which to grow cattle. It's also a reason we don't have a lot of hog production in this region of the country. It's just too hot too much of the year to get adequate growth. So what we do is we channel those cattle to the feed yards, and as they move from this region of the country to the Midwest or the Southern Great Plains, those cattle are moving to a system where they're raising crop aftermath, wheat pastures, available forages, and utilizing a resource that otherwise would not be used or would be plowed back under. Uh, and so it, while it looks from a geographic perspective as perhaps inefficient, from an action management perspective, it's a very efficient system. However, because you've got to transport cattle a long way, that does create a basis difference in the marketplace. In any given week, in any region, there's easily a $25 to $30 per hundred weight price spread on calves in the same weight class. By and large, that's driven by transportation basis. So for example, my family owns a ranch in western Colorado. We're relatively close to a large feeding packing complex in eastern Colorado, uh, about a 200 mile uh, distance to that market. My friends in Florida are at a competitive disadvantage because they're further away. Uh, as you all know, the price of diesel is such that that cost of transporting animals to a more efficient feeding sector, you take a basis hit. And so this is one of the things that we hear a lot about is, geez, why, why do cattle in the Southeast sell at a lower rate or lower per head or lower per hundred weight level? because of this transport basis. And that's an important consideration as we try to manage risk. Input costs, no doubt about it, is, uh, for, for our industry, particularly the cattle feeding business, the cost of inputs is a huge issue. Um, price of corn over the last decade, if you've been a corn farmer, by and large, you've found successive uh, happiness, or rising levels of happiness in each successive year um, as this market is ratcheted upward. At first glance, you look at that and you think, well, that doesn't look like, you know, that's certainly a trend, it's not that big a deal. Let me put it in context. This is some data that's, that's put out by a Kansas State University's uh, uh, Department of, of Agricultural Economics, uh, and they do a monthly closeout where they summarize all the data from Kansas feed yards, predominantly Western Kansas yards. This is their, co their feeding cost per hundred yards. You look at the last five years, 2005 to 2009, the combined data set, we've got a relatively even cost of production. There's certainly some variation, but operating somewhere between $69 a hundred weight to $71 a hundred weight. Managing risk in that kind of environment, um, it's like the commercial, so easy, even a caveman can do it. Okay? But look at last year. All sorts of volatility over the course of one year and led to the very beginnings of this year, and this is the first data summary that I've got out of, of this data set is the January closeout. We averaged $83, almost 15 bucks a hundred weight higher than the running five-year average. That's a dramatic impact of the cost of input. Summarized in the 14 year period, 1990 to 2003, feed yard cost of gain was about $261 a head. The last four years combined, almost $500. That's a dramatic challenge. And so when we hear people say, well, golly, your prices are going up for cattle, and certainly we are on a rising market today, 
Rising prices do not necessarily equate to rising returns in terms of net return sets. And so what's happening is this price is actually chasing the cost of production. Uh, and so many, for many of our producers, their margins today are not significantly better uh, than they were uh, two decades ago, even though cattle prices have also risen dramatically because we simply can't overcome this, this price of of uh, inputs. And this, this chart shows it very clearly. The red line is this break even. So if you can get price to jump above that red line, you make money. If you sell cattle at the same price as the red <coughs> line, you broke even. You know, the bank is still with you. No one's terribly unhappy. Um, but when it drops below, when that market drops below the red line, sends off a few warning signals, and that's when you get a few more calls from your local lender uh, to have a conversation. And if you notice, we went through an extended period of time here, nearly two and a half years, where we were really undervalued in terms of the price we're getting for cattle given the cost of, of <coughs> inputs. And for the cattle feed sector, that equated to this huge loss of equity. Okay? Now remember, in a commodity business, in a commodity, the classic definition of commodity is that in a average year, the average producer breaks even. Okay, that's classic commodity production. Over time, the average producer breaks even. Okay, the best producers make money, the worst producers lose money. But in this kind of, of equation, we have massive equity. Uh, and that continues to be a concern to us as we watch the rising input prices. As you can see where the price of beef and cattle was sufficient to overcome some of that uh, input cost rise, but we struggled against that in the last uh, half of 2010 because we simply couldn't keep up with the cost. Now, this burden of accumulated aggravation is certainly not all the fault of ethanol. But ethanol policy has played its role. It's increased the cost of production for livestock and poultry. And it's introduced volatility into an already relatively volatile market to the point that in commodity markets are credit and financing just to cover the risk management is about 65% higher than it was a decade ago. So, it, so just the, the credit cost to manage your risk has risen by 65%. In the last decade. Then just throw in a little bit of turmoil in our lending and banking industry, and a whole lot of new regulations and issues to deal with in that realm. We begin to see how we start to stack issue on top of issue, uh, which for small independent business is hard to manage. This rapid rise in agricultural land prices and historic market volatility. It's not just uh, that, you know, if we were looking at all